The FBI in Peace and War. Another great story based on Frederick L. Collins' copyrighted book, The FBI in Peace and War. Drama, thrills, action. Tonight's transcribed story, Something for Nothing. And then he said, uh, where were you stationed during the war, Major Oliver? And I said, well, I served six months in North Africa. (laughs) You didn't tell him you served the six months for passing phony jags, did you? Uh, Don't interrupt, please, old boy. You're spoiling a good story. Sorry. Carry on. Uh, So he said, North Africa, that certainly is a coincidence. I was stationed at... Old boy. Yes? Would you mind turning up your hand, old boy? Hmm? What uh, for? I have a nasty suspicion that you're manipulating those cards. Oh. Harry, my profound apologies. I was so wrapped up in the story that I did it unconsciously. Uh, look, old man, have you got a pair of deuces, a king, a six, and a nine? Uh-huh. I suppose you've got uh, four aces. Oh, no, no, no. Just a full house. I didn't want to make it obvious. <laughs> it's a good thing we don't play for money. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you deal. Give me the bad hand this time. No, thanks. I'd, uh, I'd better be getting back to the motel. Edna wants to look over the town tonight. Well, she's seen Miami before. Well, if you remember, old boy, last time we tackled this village, the local police were very unfriendly. Oh, yeah. As a matter of fact, they were... Uh, Just a moment. Uh, Yes, uh, who is it? The bellboy, Major. Who? Oh, the bellboy. I've uh, got him keeping me posted on the new guest. Uh, Come in, Jackson. Come in. How are you, Major? Hello. Anything interesting? Well... Oh, you can speak in front of this gentleman. He and his wife are business associates of mine. Well, there's a party just checked into 1106 last night. Their name is Wilkinson. They got a 55 Cadillac convertible. Oh? He tipped the boy two bucks for the bags. They come from Oklahoma. He owns four department stores, and they're paying 380 bucks a week for their rooms without meals. Oh, thank you, Jackson. That was a splendid piece of reconnaissance. Uh, here you are, my boy. Oh, thank you, Major Oliver. I'll be seeing you. Bye. Did I see you give him $20? Yes, Harry, you did. As your partner, I suppose half of that is mine. It is? Do you mind your generosity? No, I guess not. If it pays off. Oh, it will, old boy. If not this one, then on the next. We're bound to hit it, you know. The law of averages and all that sort of thing. Oliver Leslie, alias the Major, and Harry Barnes, alias Handsome Harry, and Edna Barnes, his wife, were three of the fastest-dealing card sharps in the profession. In the summer, they worked the luxurious cruise boats going to Europe. In the winter, they infested fashionable resorts like Miami. Their operation was quick and painless to the victim, and the opening move was always taken by the Major. And then the Major said four spades, and they passed, and I said six spades, just like that. Well, the Major laid down the ace, king of diamonds, a singleton ace of club. Clarence, you're not getting this, are you? I'm trying, dear. Well, if you just stop fiddling with that whatchamacallit or whatever that thing is. It's a spinning reel, dear, used for fishing. Well, couldn't you do that some other time? Do what? Whatever you're doing. Well, I'm just putting a few drops of oil on it. Well, do you or do you not want to hear how we play this hand? Why don't you tell me after dinner? You fall asleep after dinner. Besides, we have another game at seven. You're playing again tonight? Why, yes, of course. Do you mind? Well, no, I guess not. I, I thought, uh... You thought what? Well, nothing. You you go ahead and play. Now, really, Clarence, if you go out fishing all day long... I wouldn't ever go if you'd come for a ride in the car or sit on the beach. Well, you know what all that hot sun does to my skin. Yes, I know. And besides, when would I ever get another chance to play with a partner like Major Oliver? Who? Major Oliver. Oh, goodness, Clarence, I've been telling you all about him. He's a member of the International Bridge Association. He's the originator of the three-count demand. Oh, yes, you did tell me. It's been one of the most exciting experiences in my whole life, playing with Major Oliver. It has? And what's more, we won a hundred and ten dollars. How much? A hundred and ten. 
Well, hey, you never won anything like that before. I never had a partner like this before. As a matter of fact, you generally lose, don't you? Clarence. Well, that's what you've always been telling me at home every day after you get back from the bridge the club. The only reason I lose is because none of those women know how to play. And you actually won a hundred and ten dollars? Or do you mean a dollar ten? One hundred and ten dollars. Well, I guess I can't complain about that, can I? I should hope not. hundred and ten dollars. Well, that, that's almost as much as we spend in a day at this joint. What's this fellow's name again? Major Leslie Oliver. Major Oliver. I guess he must be a pretty sharp man with a deck of cards now that you mention it. Uh, come in. Oh, hello, Harry. Where's Edna? Uh, she's down in that dress shop in the lobby. She'll meet us in the card room at 7. Good. So, what's the deal? This uh, Wilkinson dame looks interesting, huh? Oh, she's perfect, Harry. I never saw a woman who liked money so much in all my life. Can she play bridge? Oh, Harry, she's horrible. <laughs> Just simply awful. I had to load every deck to make us win. <laughs> you would get one like that. Who were you playing against? Oh, that old couple, the Binghams. We took them for $110. You couldn't do any better than that? Oh, my dear old boy. Every time I got hold of the deck, I gave my partner six quick tricks, and even with that, she just bumbled through. Well, lead us to him. This ought to be easy. Oh, it will be, but uh, quite painful from an aesthetic point of view. <laughs> I can imagine. Now, well, what's the routine? Well, tonight, you and Edna had better lose about uh, $150. Okay. And tomorrow, we'll take you big, say 500 Okay, I got it. Well, I'll see you in the card room at 7. Yeah, where are you going, Harry? Well, the horses are still running out in Hollywood Park. I'd like to invest a few dollars in a filly named Miss Calculate. Oh, gambling is a very bad habit, old boy. Yes, I know it, old boy. Never take a chance unless you've got a sure thing. Yes, I know. Well, see you later. Cheer up. Cheer up. Oh, uh, Harry. Yeah? Uh, she's apt to bid two no trump without a trick in her hand. Don't let it upset you, old boy. I won't. Oh, chin up, old boy. Right, huh? Carry on. Carry on, old man. See you later. <laughs> Back to Act Two of Something for Nothing in just a moment. What does the code of conduct mean to the American military man? It means recognizing the fact that he is an American, prepared at all times to guard his country and his way of life. It means assuming responsibility for his actions, knowing that what he does and is reflects on those about him. And finally, it means a trust in God and in the United States of America and a dedication to the principles which made America free. That is what the code means to every American military man. And now, act two of tonight's story, Something for Nothing. Among the steps taken in trying to locate a fast-moving sharper like Major Oliver were the warning notices sent to resort hotels all over the country. An alert manager of a Miami hotel reported a guest who looked like Oliver. Agent Reynolds flew to Miami immediately. Within an hour, Agent Reynolds, sitting in the lobby, saw Oliver leave the hotel and walk toward the beach. Did you see him, Mr. Reynolds? Yes, he just went out the lobby. That's Oliver, all right. I thought so. Especially after I noticed how much time he spent in the card room. It's a shame he had to pick our hotel. I... I hope there's not too much publicity about this. You couldn't manage to arrest him outside the hotel, could you? As a matter of fact, I'm not going to arrest him at all. You're not? Unfortunately, there's no charge outstanding against him at the present time. But these notices... Just you sent... warning you to be on the lookout. Well, aren't you going to do anything? <laughs> We're going to try. I'm afraid I don't understand, Mr. Reynolds. Well, let me put it this way, Mr. Daly. We know what Oliver is doing, but we haven't got the kind of evidence that'll stand up in court. Most of the victims of this racket squeal loudly just after they've been taken. But when it comes time to testify and admit openly that they've been fools, they suddenly drop the charges. Oh, I see. Now, if we could once catch Oliver in the process of trimming a sucker, 
We could put him away nicely. But that's almost impossible, isn't it? Not quite. It could be done with a little luck. I might need your cooperation. Oh, of course. Have you got a room for me for the next few days? Oh, we're terribly crowded, but I guess I can squeeze you in. Good. I suppose you'll want a room somewhere near Oliver? Not necessarily. I think I'll spend most of my time in the card room. Agent Reynolds sat unobtrusively in the card room of the hotel and watched Major Oliver and Mrs. Wilkinson playing against Harry and Edna Barnes. Agent Reynolds was pleased to note that the swindle was proceeding on schedule when the Major and Mrs. Wilkinson won substantial sums of money on the first and second nights. And then I took her queen with my last trump, and that was game and rubber. You won again tonight? Two hundred and fifty dollars. Aren't you proud of me? Two hundred and fifty? Well, I really hated to take it from this nice young couple, but the Major says they're quite well-to-do and can easily afford it. Tomorrow night, we're going to double the stakes. Uh, tomorrow? Yes, we're going to start right after dinner. Flora, you didn't forget about the Mary J. The who? I told you all about it, dear. I've hired the Mary J for the whole day. We're going to sail out to one of the keys, and the captain will cook us a picnic supper. Now, and... Clarence, you know I can't stand small sailing boats. But the first day we got here, you promised you'd go sailing just once. I'm sorry. It's out of the question. But you go ahead, dear, and bring me home some nice fish, and I'll have the chef clean them. Flora, are you going to spend our entire vacation in a stuffy card room? The card room is not stuffy. It's perfectly air-conditioned. You know what I mean. Yes, I do. And if you will reflect that I've already won more than $500... Oh, don't be an idiot, Flora. What's $500? You've got 50 times that in your personal checking account. There was a time, Clarence, when $500 was a lot of money to both of us. Well, sure, there was 30 years ago. But good grief, Flora, we've made our pie. Let's have a little fun out of it. But I am having fun, lots of it. That's ridiculous. You're not having fun. You're playing bridge. It just so happens. Oh, come on the boat with me just for this one day. I'm sorry, Clarence. I've already accepted the Major's invitation to play. Well, you could call him and tell him that... I'd do no such thing. But one evening of bridge. It's quite possible, Clarence that I could win as much as a thousand dollars with the stakes doubled. Oh, all right, Flora, you go ahead and play. Now, you know you'll have much more fun without me. I'd only be in the way. Never mind, you play your game. But I'll tell you one thing. I hope you get trimmed four ways to Christmas. I hope they take you good. <laughs> Come in. Ah, uh, why, hello, Mrs. Wilkinson. How are you, my dear? Come right in. Major, I just took a chance that you might be here. I wanted to catch you before you went down to lunch. Well, I'm delighted you did. Shall I ring room service and we'll have a cocktail? Uh, no, thank you. Mr. Wilkinson will be waiting for me in the dining room. Oh, I thought you said he'd be sailing today. Uh, no, he decided against it. Mm. He didn't really want to very much. It was just a notion. Oh, I see. Besides, I told him he might watch us play tonight and see how you and I make all this money. <laughs> well, that would be a privilege, but we could lose, you know. It's just possible. Uh, yes, I know. And uh, that's why I thought we might talk for a few minutes before this evening. Uh, talk? Uh, well, what I mean is we might, uh, well, go over our strategy for the bonds. Well, we know our strategy, don't we? Just win. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. But I thought if each of us could interpret the other's bid more exactly... Inter... You don't mean signals, do you? Oh, well, not precisely. That is, we wouldn't say anything that could be construed. I don't think we need to worry about any extra arrangements for tonight, Mrs. Wilkinson. We've been doing pretty well so far, haven't we? Oh, yes, of course, but if the stakes are going to be doubled... No, I wouldn't worry about that, my dear. If you continue to play your same open and uh, <clears throat> daring game, I don't see how we can lose. Well, you just said it was possible. Don't you think if we had a more reliable means of exchanging information... Oh, I think we are fine just as we are, Mrs. Wilkinson. All right, Major, I guess we are. I'll see you at seven. Yes, you won't stay for a cocktail. No, I don't think I'll drink anything today. I want my head to be perfectly clear tonight. <laughs> After all, the stakes are pretty high, aren't they? Oh, yes, quite high. But I always think that makes it more interesting, don't you? Wow. 
Back to Something for Nothing in just a moment. Friends, this is Jimmy Wallington. You know, many great men have attained the highest office in our land, the presidency of the United States. Can you guess the name of this man? He was born in Virginia in 1856, the son of a clergyman. He graduated from Princeton University, began his practice of law in Georgia, and wrote many articles and books on political and historical matters. It was his writings which first brought him to the attention of the general public. He became an associate professor at several colleges, and in 1902 was made president of the university from which he had graduated 23 years before. After serving as governor of New Jersey, he was elected to the presidency of the United States in 1912 and re-elected for a second term. The most important event of his administration, of course, was the First World War. Well, you should have his name by now, but in case you don't, here's one more important clue. He was a strong supporter of the ideals embodied in the League of Nations. Yes, he was Woodrow Wilson, 28th President of the United States. His life is part of your American heritage. Three of tonight's story, Something for Nothing. When Agent Reynolds was convinced that a swindle was actually in operation and that Mrs. Clarence Wilkinson of Claremore, Oklahoma, was the intended victim, he had a talk with Mr. Wilkinson. You mean all three of them are swindlers? That's right. Oliver and the Barnes couple have been working together for years. And you think they're going to take Mrs. Wilkinson tonight? Or tomorrow. You see, the system is to let her win a few hundred dollars. And then when she has complete confidence, the Major manipulates the cards, and the two of them lose disastrously. The Major gallantly pays his half of the losses, and your wife would have to do the same. <laughs> <laughs> Something funny about that? Yes, there sure is. It's just about the funniest thing I've heard since I left Claremore. <laughs> oh, would you mind letting me in on it? Well, I, I don't know whether you could appreciate it, Miss, Mr. Reynolds. Uh, are you married? Uh, not yet. Well, when you do, steer away from the bridge player, son. Oh, you mean your wife? Morning, noon, and night. And what's more, she reads books about it and goes to lectures. She eats, sleeps, and dreams, bridge. But, but what's so terrible? What, what, what's so awful? <laughs> The horrible part is everybody tells me she's the worst player west of the Mississippi. <laughs> I see you have a problem, Mr. Wilkinson. A problem? Well, son, that, that is a very grave understatement. My wife is, is completely irrational on two subjects, bridge and money. Then you'll be pleased to stop this swindle. Stop it? Well, with your wife's cooperation. Oh, listen, Mr. Reynolds, don't stop her now. Let her lose. Well... What I had in mind... Yes, I know what you had in mind. You want to trap these people when she hands over the money. Well, now, listen, Mr. Reynolds. If she's in on this, she'll louse up the whole scheme. Believe me, let her lose. And then you can step in. Well... You, you want evidence, don't you? Well, there it is, in flagranti delicto. <laughs> you have got a point, Mr. Wilkinson. If she plays the game innocently... Of course, it's the only possible way. Oh, wait till they hear this around Claremore. She'll never live it down. Never! <laughs> with the proper precautions against Major Oliver's possible departure, and with another agent keeping constant check on the Barnes couple, the bridge foursome was allowed to continue its play. In due course, the expected happened. Is that you, dear? Oh, Clarence, I, I thought you'd be in bed. Well, I don't like to miss your interesting accounts of the bridge game, dear. How much did you win tonight? I'm going to bed, Clarence. I've got a headache. But how did the game come out, dear? I waited up specially to hear. Did you win as much tonight? We didn't win. We lost. You did? Well, it couldn't have been much. We lost $9,200. Really? $9,200. I had to pay half of it. Is that so? Well, I just said it was so, didn't I? I had to give my check for 46. 
Hundred dollars. Oh, my, that was a shellacking, wasn't it? Clarence, don't you understand? But of course I do, dear. You lost $4,600. And we wouldn't have except that they got every single card in the deck, just everything, one slam after the other. Oh, my. Imagine what the ladies in Claremore will say when they hear this. Clarence, if you ever dare breathe a word... Me? I wouldn't say a thing, but it's bound to be in all the papers. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Why should it be in the papers? Well, my goodness, Flora, when someone loses $4,600 to a team of international swindlers, there's bound to be a little publicity. What did you say? A team of international swindlers. Major Oliver and the Barnes couple, an FBI agent, told me this morning... Clarence, if this is your idea of a joke... Well, it's not my idea, but it is a pretty good joke. They took you, Flora, lock, stock, and barrel. You're making it up. Oh, no, you've been had, my dear, in spades, doubled and redoubled. And you knew this morning? Uh Uh-huh. And you let Major Oliver... Uh Uh-huh. Oh, Clarence, how could you? Easy as rolling off a log. I'll get it. (gasps) Hello? Oh, yes, hello, Mr. Reynolds. Uh, yes, she's here. Uh Uh-huh. I just told her. The what? Oh, sure. We'll we'll be right down. Say, uh, uh, Mr. Reynolds, is the major there with you? Well, could I talk to him a second? Thank you. Hello, uh, major. Say, uh, I want to ask you something. What is your honest opinion of my wife's bridge game? Uh Uh-huh. Well, that's what I thought. Uh, Thanks a lot. Uh, Yes, Mr. Reynolds, we'll be right down. We've got to go downtown to the FBI office, Flora. Uh, They want your affidavit. I'll do no such thing. Oh, yes, you will, dear, if you want me to keep this out of the Claremore papers. Clarence, you're not threatening me. I sure am. But you wouldn't let the papers... I most certainly would, and what's more, I'd give them a direct quote from Major Leslie Oliver. How about her bridge game, the Major was asked? Well, he replied... Confidentially, Clarence, she... you couldn't. I could, but I won't if you promise. Oh, I do, Clarence, anything you want. All right. We'll discuss that later. Shall we go downtown now? Do I have to? You do. And I want to be there, too. I'm strongly considering posting bail for the Major. He may be a swindler, but in one respect, I consider him a very honest man. Come along, Flora. <laughs> With undeniable evidence in the form of Flora Wilkinson's check, Leslie Oliver and his two partners entered a plea of guilty. No other victims came forward to add charges, so each was sentenced to a minimum term of one year in prison. When last we talked with Mr. Wilkinson, he told us his wife had given up bridge and no longer was trying to get something for nothing. In tonight's transcribed story, Kathleen Cordell played the part of Flora Wilkinson. Eric Dressler was Clarence Wilkinson. This radio dramatization for the FBI and Peace and War was written by Louis Pelletier. These programs are produced and directed by Betty Mandeville. All names and characters used on the program are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This program is based upon Frederick L. Collins' copyrighted book, The FBI in Peace and War. And the broadcast does not imply endorsement, authorization, or approval by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.